Hey, can everyone hear me okay? Does anyone, first off, does anyone not have a piece of paper like this? If you don't, put your hand up and my colleague will come and give you one of these. So whilst he's doing that, what we're going to try and achieve in the next 70 minutes is to perform an audit of a cluster, right? It's almost impossible to be able to secure a Kubernetes cluster in 70 minutes. So what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to take you on a journey of where you should look, what you should be thinking about when you're performing said audit, and then finally, what defense mechanisms can we put in so that once we have a good understanding of how secure or insecure our cluster is, when new workloads and new resources are trying to be deployed to our cluster, we want to be able to stop the bad ones from getting in, right? You don't want to have to keep repeating this audit over and over again. So to start with, my name's Steve Wade. I'm head of engineering at uh, KSOC, and I have my assistant slash boss, uh, Jimmy, with me. You were mostly here before, so hey, everyone. <laughs> yeah. So a brief agenda, what's the mission we're trying to complete? So the first 10 minutes is going to be a cluster setup, so everyone's going to set up their own cluster, and they'll be performing an audit of that cluster. Then we're going to uh, perform an asset inventory, so we're going to look at what's running on the cluster, um, what are the things that are important to us when we're performing an audit. Then we're going to talk about workload hardening, so how can, we, how can we make the workloads that are currently deployed more secure, what are the things that we should look out for. Then we're going to move on to RBAC, so everybody knows you know, RBAC anywhere is a bit, is a bit of a mess. Um, so what are some of the easy attack vectors from an RBAC standpoint that allow you to elevate your privileges, see things you shouldn't be able to see, and do things you shouldn't be able to do? And then finally, we're going to finish up with some defensive guardrails. So we're going to try and deploy some workloads. And some of them are going to get in, and some of them are not going to get in. So let's get started. In, on your laptop, in an incognito or private browser, if you all browse to this link, It should take you to something that looks a little bit like this. Do a quick zoom in. Sure. Is the internet behaving right now? I guess we're about to find out. We're about to find out, yes. Everyone successfully on the site? Okay, so if you click on the Getting Started link on the left-hand side there, don't double-click on this link. Open it in a new tab, because we're going to flick back and forward between the URL. One more time. Yeah. Okay, sure. No problem. So when you get to this uh, blue button, if you right click and open in new tab, because we're going to use this website to drive the workshop that we're about to go through. You should receive a login prompt. If you log in using the credentials on your piece of paper, Using incognito is really important here so you don't get mixed up with your corporate G Suite accounts or your personal G Suite. Oh, Adam's, Adam will bring one over to you. When you get here, just click I understand. Paper. If anyone needs any help, just please put your hands up and Adam or Jimmy I'll will come help. and assist. Do we have one more? No. Adam will probably have one. We hit our 60. Okay. Is anybody following along, playing along? You can, you can do this in your own.
click through when you ask when it's ask you, you about the cloud shell click start cloud shell when you get to this section down here this is the important piece so there is a repository that we're going to clone into cloud shell that's going to make things a lot easier so don't just hit confirm you need to scroll down click trust repo hopefully you all trust me that i'm not going to go and do something rogue for you um, hit trust repo and then finally hit confirm I'm going to stop at this point and make sure that everybody gets to this point where they have a cloud shell running before I move on. Anybody not got to this stage yet? Adam, could you come and assist this gentleman at the back here? He's struggling to, sure. Or Andrew. Shout. No problem. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we are going to run make init. So what make init is going to do is it's going to ask us to authenticate. When it asks you to authenticate, we're going to go through the, the flow, use the same credentials that are on your piece of paper. Then we're going to install some uh, default workloads and a couple of uh, binaries and packages that we're going to leverage throughout this workshop. And then we'll get started with uh, the workload and asset configuration. So what you're going to want to do is flick between these two tabs. So this uh, little button here allows you to be able to copy and paste into your clipboard. So firstly, copy and paste this one. Um, it will ask you for an authentication code. You simply need to take this URL here. Open it in a new window. Log in again with your credentials. Copy this token at the bottom. Enter the token here. Click authorize. And then reconnect. You can also do the set. Should have it right here. Do a uh,
ID. This one. All right. Once this has worked, once you've gone through the flow, you should be able to see this little prompt down the bottom. The key point here is that you see this in yellow. This should be your project ID. If this is not your project ID, put your hand up and I'll go through the flow again so that we can make it work. Okay, so at the top here, you wanna select the organization. Select securekubernetes.com. Click through on here. Once you've clicked through on there, run gcloud auth login again. And you should repeat the flow. So it'll ask you to authorize, you'll get the token, copy the token back in. Sure, so from the top here, select the organization, select securekubernetes.com, select your project. Once you've selected your project, come back to the terminal, do a gcloud auth login. You'll go through the flow, token should pop up, copy and paste the token into the terminal, complete the prompts, and then you should see this little yellow section at the, at the bottom. Okay, anyone not at this section? You zoom in. Yeah. All right. Let me come home. Yeah. I see it.
All right, are we good to continue? Cool, okay, so. Once you perform this, if you do a kubectl get pods. Oh, hold on. If you rerun in it, it's going to, because we need to go and get a cube config. And I think now we've finally authenticated, we should be able to do this. So run dot slash init dot sh again. Okay, so what I did there, I ran dot slash init dot sh. You'll go through the loop again. Now you're authenticated. We will obtain a cube config for this cluster, and then we should be able to start. To validate that your kubeconfig is working, if we run kubectl get nodes, you should get an output like this, just a single node. Anybody not at this point stuck on setting the project still? Okay, where did you where did you get to? I didn't get anywhere. Okay, so did you so? I'm sorry. No problem. If you have you got this link? No, I don't. Okay, so go to tinyurl.com setcon workshop. No problem. then what you're going to want to do is make sure you open that in an incognito browser. Then on this button, when you open it, open it in a new tab, because we're going to flick between the website and the cluster. Once you're in there, you want to select the project. So at the top here, go to the top, like, so I went, right at the top here. Okay. Can you help the guy in the purple? Yeah, just get, get set up. No problem. Okay. So the first thing that we are going to perform is an asset inventory. So we want to know what's running, what are we dealing with, what are the things that we need to start looking at from an audit perspective. So I'm not going to go down this list extensively of the things that you should be looking for. However, some things that are useful and I would recommend you look for is the version of Kubernetes that's currently running, reasons why this is important. There are CVEs in some Kubernetes versions. Um, there are also deprecations as well um, in some of the API specifications. So not necessarily a security thing to be aware of, but when it comes to upgrading your Kubernetes clusters, it can be an important thing to note, right? So if there's a deprecated uh, API, you're still using that API, you upgrade your Kubernetes cluster and that API doesn't exist. The first time you deploy your resource, it will work. When you try and upgrade that resource, so you upgrade a deployment or you upgrade a replica set, it will not work. So one of the things you really want to focus on, specifically if you're a, a platform engineer and responsible for, your, for the Kubernetes clusters that you're running at your organization, is to try and be ahead of the curve of the application developers, right? Because what you don't want to do is upgrade your Kubernetes cluster and then the application developers can't deploy their applications. That's not a, that's not a good look. So, 
there are some links here to um, some official Kubernetes CVE streams so you can see all of the CVEs. Kubernetes does have CVEs um, that you can go through the versions that they were fixed in. Um, I'm not going to go through these in detail, but feel free to, to take a look at these in your own time. Then from a, uh, from a managed provider perspective, there are also a number of things to note here. So like EKS and GKE and, and AKS on Azure, they, they all have limits, right? There's, there's edges and boundaries that you can't go outside of. Um, I've left the links here. They are important things to note, specifically um, when, when you're dealing with security groups and you know, your applications need to talk outbound to something is running in those cloud providers. So hands off of people that are running EKS or running in AWS. Google Cloud? Azure? None of these because you're running on premise? All right, or no Kubernetes at all. Okay. So again, some other things to note from a, from a networking perspective. There are also limitations there as well uh, to, be, to be aware of the subnets that you're running in. Uh, some of the plugins, the, the, uh, specifically the AWS EKS uh, CNI plugin, that allows you to have an extension to actually leverage the Amazon security groups. Um, but they can, they can sometimes get a little bit uh, mangled. So I would recommend that specifically if you're running AWS just to, to, to read through these plugin configurations. So the first thing we're going to want to do is when we perform an audit is we want to know what are all of the different API resources that are currently running. So the first command that we're going to run is kubectl API resources dash O wide. What that's going to do is print out a load of noise. And it is essentially every API version that is available in your Kubernetes cluster and the resources that that API version provides you. So this gives us a good initial understanding of what's currently, what's currently possible to run. This is not what's running, right? These are the options that are available to us to deploy. So we can see here that we're able to deploy some, uh, some roles or some pod security policies or some pod disruption budgets. So when we go deeper into doing our audit, we should be looking at these types of resources and trying to find the, the number of resources that are currently running for each of these API groups. From there, we can go further and look from a security standpoint at the configuration of each of those resources. So essentially, it's a, la it's a layered approach. We're going to start right at the top, going to get a good overview and understanding of what possible resources can run. Then we go to the resources themselves, and then finally we go to the configuration of those resources. So this is our initial starting point. So again, this was API resources dash O wide. Second thing we want to run, we want to know what containers do we currently have available? What, what containers are currently running? So again, I'm flicking between the asset inventory page and the terminal itself. So I'm now down here on list all container images. When we print this out, we can see the number of containers uh, that are currently running and what type of things are currently running. So we can see here, for example, we have uh, Nginx 1.19.3. We have an unprivileged Nginx. We have a couple of things that are uh, running pseudo as well. So again, from a security standpoint, we could think about scanning these images. What kind of vulnerabilities do these individual images have, right? As, as an application developer myself, sometimes security isn't always top of mind, right? Releasing that feature to production is more top of mind, potentially, than the security of the underlying container. The application, yes, that's top of mind, but the artifact that's currently running in, in the production cluster or you know, even your development clusters, maybe not top of mind. Maybe you've got uh, you know, a, a generic configuration, you use something like Helm or Customize, and 
your SRE team or your platform team are providing you with this configuration and they just say, all you need to do is add your image in here and set a few variables and away you go. Right? But that whole configuration that they have could be completely insecure. Right? And you're, you're replicating this over tens or hundreds of workloads where you've got tens or hundreds of insecure configurable workloads. Right? And there could be many reasons for that and we're going to dig into some of them. Hands up people who are doing container image scanning. A handful of you. Tools that you may want to use, things like Gripe, things like Trivi, Claire. Um, make sure you, you're running them in CI. Make sure you're running them before you push them to the registry. Some people that I know push them to the registry and then scan them. Well, if you push them to the registry and then scan them, they're available. Um, so they could be on your Kubernetes cluster before you even get a chance to scan it. The other thing I'd recommend doing as well is um, using the image digest and not the tag itself. So are fam people familiar with uh, time of change, time of use, what that means? So imagine I tag an image 1.2 and I configure that in my Kubernetes deployment and I'm about to deploy it. I tagged the image as 1.2, remember. Then someone else, because all of these tags are, you know, that you can override them, someone else pushes an image, 1.2. So now I'm ready to deploy my application. Well, I'm deploying theirs and not mine. So when I'm using it, it's now different from the time that I actually changed it, right? Because it, tags can be overwritten. However, an image digest is a specific point in time. If you use the image digest, when, it, when we deploy that workload to Kubernetes, it's going to use that digest configuration, right, which is a, the makeup of the image itself and not the tag. Right? So from a, from a security standpoint, I'm not really happy with the images that I'm seeing here. Right? I'd much prefer digests, something that is, u something that is unique and I can validate. Right? I can easily come in here, not with the Nginx ones, but if I had my own registry, I was running at my own company, or I was a rogue employee, I could easily come and o override someone else's tag. It could be doing all kinds of nonsense, Bitcoin mining. Uh, um, it could be browsing and trying to work out and plot the landscape of the Kubernetes cluster. It could be doing anything. And that application developer has no idea, right? They just see the tag and they've deployed it. And maybe it's working, maybe it's not. Maybe I've added another process in there that they don't even know existed. And then from an application standpoint, it's working. They can hit an endpoint, they see the website, and I'm over here doing Bitcoin mining on the side. So the next one we're going to do is we're going to look at all of the resources that are currently running in our cluster. So again, here we can do kubectl, kube kubectl, depending upon how you, uh, how you say it. Uh, get all, and then we're going to pass the dash dash all namespaces. So what this is going to do is it's going to give us a good understanding of everything that's running in every namespace in your Kubernetes cluster. Granted, from an RBAC perspective, we need the ability to be able to see everything in our cluster, but because we're talking about security, I decided to give everybody cluster admin because that's incredibly secure, uh, and we are now going to be able to see everything. So if we run this, you'll see Kubernetes displays it quite nicely for us. We have the replica sets that are currently running. We have the, de the deployments that are currently there. Daemon set services, all of the pods, et cetera, et cetera. However, one of the things to note is this is not giving you absolutely everything, right? It's giving you everything from a kubectl standpoint. So there is a tool uh, called um, get all. which kind of actually provides you all of the resources, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to run this now. And what you'll see is it prints out a lot more than what the default kubectl get all is. So when you're doing a cluster audit, don't just take what kubectl tells you as gospel, right? There's other tools that are around that actually give you a much deeper and richer uh, response. So now in our terminal, if we just run kettle, it takes a little bit of time. And now you can see there's a lot more printed out, right? We've now got storage classes. We've got things about RBAC. We've got priority classes. 
So there's a lot more richer understanding now of what's going on from a Kubernetes perspective. So I use this tool more extensively than I do the kubectl get all because th this is the real get all. kubectl get all just you know the the bare minimum. So now we have an understanding of the images that are currently running, the resources that are currently there. We've talked about images and why tags are not, not great and we should be using image digest. So that's something from an audit perspective that we should be going back to our application developers and saying and proposing to them, move to image digests, don't use image tags. We've got a good understanding now of, of what's running. So we've got some deployments in there, we've got some daemon sets, we've got some pods. So now what we're gonna do is start to look at some workload configuration. So now if we copy this link here, so now I'm on the second number two workload configurations. I'm copying and pasting the, uh, the command. Click yes. And now we're gonna go through an interactive flow. So what I wanna talk about is some of the ways that applications and workloads can be insecure. Right, and there's, there's many different ways that they can be insecure. We're gonna talk about how they become insecure and we're also gonna talk about from a defense mechanism, what are the things that we can do to be able to secure them. So the, the classic one, pods running as root, everybody has at least one of these uh, pods running in their Kubernetes cluster running as root. So if you hit enter, we're gonna deploy, we're gonna create a deployment called Nginx and we're gonna use the well-known nginx container if we just keep hitting enter so we think nginx probably may be secure well the standard nginx container runs as root so if i can get in that container i'm going to have all kinds of fun all right i could do do whatever i wanted so the default nginx container is now running as root so what what options do we have available to us to make sure that that can't happen right from a from a cluster audit perspective containers running as root especially if i'm a rogue employer or i managed to get into a kubernetes cluster or you've you've given me too much access i uh you know i can i can go rogue so we we have the ability to use security contexts so we can set uh run as non-root to true. So what does that look like? From a deployment perspective now, we are down at the bottom in the security context section. And we, we're saying that for this image, we want to force you to not be able to run this as root. So if we click enter here, Now what we'll see is the, can, the pod can't run, right? So the pod actually runs as root, but we've set the security context to not run as, uh, as non-root, therefore Kubernetes is not gonna deploy it. So we can see that's the case. We do a describe of that pod and we look for the error and Kubernetes is telling us that you know, we're trying to run it. We, we have a container that's running as root and we've specifically told it that it can't run as root. So security context is gonna be a key thing that we're gonna be wanting to look for when we are looking at workload configurations, right? What a, lot of people are, what a lot of people may or may not be doing is getting their deployment configuration set up, not knowing or not worrying about the security context because there's, there's some things you have to think about, right? Not everything, some things are gonna to have to run as root right, potentially, like, or you could have public images like the Nginx one that runs as root. So there's a lot of work from an application development perspective to get that application to not run as root. So what I would recommend from an application developer perspective is this concept of having base images. So if you're running Java or you're running Go or whatever language you're running, to construct base images that meet and comply to a specific set of standards in your organization, right? One of the obvious ones, don't run it as root, 
but run it as a specific type of user. Put the binary in a specific location. Put the config for the application in a specific location. Set the, u set the, the user and group IDs, right? All of these things allow you to be able to define workload configurations that are standardized across your organization and then we can start to look for anomalies because anything that doesn't have a, UID, uh, a user ID or a group ID of a specific number, we know that that doesn't conform to your company standards and we can start to alert on that, right? With, a, with the ever-changing Kubernetes landscape and the ability and ease for you to be able to deploy hundreds of applications in your, uh, for your company, consistency is gonna be key, right? You, do, you don't want to have to go on a long root cause analysis for you to try and figure out what's going on with your application, right? If there's sets of standards that your applications must to conform to, it's better that the workload cannot be deployed than it gets deployed and is vulnerable, right? A little bit of friction with the application developer to make sure that we have secure workloads running in our platform is a lot better than being audited and being, and, you know, having to tell everybody that all of your containers run as root and everyone's just copying and pasting configuration around. So, now what we have, we've seen, sorry, is that we have a public image that is running, running as root. And now what we want to do is stop it from running as root, right? And there's a number of options for us to be able to do that. So Nginx Inc. actually launched or created a unprivileged container image. So newsflash, this is the one if you're running Nginx that I would recommend that you, you use. You don't use the normal public Nginx image, right? Highly insecure. So it's the same deployment, different image. We're going to set runners uh, non-root to true. We're going to deploy this. Now we see that this pod is actually running, right? So this means that this container, this container obviously is not uh, running as root. So if we keep clicking through, we can now see that from an ID perspective that we are now running as the Nginx user, right? So this is a more secure image than the well-known Nginx image. So there are sometimes images that are available to you that are more secure than the ones that you know and love, right? So don't just go on Docker Hub and type in the thing that you, you, uh, you want to leverage, like Nginx as an example, and just take it verbatim, right? Do some due diligence into how secure the, the, uh, the container is that you're actually deploying. Or maybe have some standards and pro processes in place so that you can't even deploy certain, certain workloads with a certain tag or sometimes from a specific registry. So, okay. Question. Sure. Is there a way to set that configuration at like a cluster database level or does it have to be at a per resource basis? So, so yeah, at, uh, at a per resource basis. So what I would recommend again is, is to try and create application templates. So if you're using something like Helm or Customize, the more standardized you can make the application from its, from its configuration standpoint, the easier this is gonna to become to manage. So we can force workloads in Kubernetes to, to, not, to not run as root, right? That's, that's great. But we can also set the user ID and group ID as well in that configuration. So again, same thing, same security context now, but we're gonna force the user and group that we want this application to run as. Why do we wanna do this? Why, why is this useful to us? So imagine I broke out of this container and I got to the underlying host. Imagine I was running as root. I can do whatever I want now on the underlying host. If I set an ID, uh, a user ID or a group ID that is not gonna be on the host, even if I break out, it's highly unlikely I'm gonna be able to do something. That's why these, U these UIDs and GUIDs are so high. I deliberately set them high because they're unlikely to clash if anyone manages to get out of the container onto the uh, to the physical node itself. So we can set these again with security context, you would endure it. If we hit enter here, we are gonna see again that that uh, application is able to run. And we can see that we have set successfully the user ID and the group ID to what we specified. Again, from a standards perspective, these things are really important. 
build up a standard within your organization of what you want to set these to and roll it out across the board. Consistency is key when it comes to Kubernetes. It's far too easy to deploy a load of rubbish that's insecure, right? And then if you're the, the poor person that ha is in the platform team or you have to perform an audit, you have to go and you know, dump all of this onto all the application developers and then they'll all do something completely different and you'll be back to square one, right? And it's just rinse and repeat over and over and over again. So again, images must be designed to work with runners user and runners group, right? We can't just set them to anything and they're just gonna, they're just gonna work. So let's try deploying the public Nginx image and setting the user and group configuration. So all we've done here is on the image specification, we've switched back to that well-known Nginx image. We're in a crash loop, right? We can't, we can't run this image with this specific configuration. This is a much safer option. This is the position that we want to be in. We want workloads to not run that don't meet our standards. Again, we can see it needs some privileges because it's, you know, it's, it's owning files, it's writing files all over the place. We've set the user and group and the user and group is unable to be able to achieve that. So this is where you, from an audit perspective, you're gonna start having conversations with your application developers and saying, look, I've, I've reviewed, I'm trying to, trying to set some standards here and your application's not, not working. Let's have that back and forward and, and you know, move your application configuration to the standard that we want to set. So important things to note here are it's gonna, the reason why we're taking such a high user and group is it reduces the risk to run, uh, or sorry, the, the user to exist on the underlying host. Um, it's, it's important that these configuration options are, are set because we we don't want to have to keep repeating the same set of audit all over again, right? We have to keep going back to the application developers and, uh, and telling them that they have to keep changing. Some things, again, do, do have to run as root, and if you, want, if you need them to run as root, you can set the group ID to zero. There are a couple of links there. Um, all of this material is gonna become available afterwards, so don't worry about trying to write those URLs down um, for reasons why these configurations are important. Anyone have any questions so far, or are we good to keep going? Okay, so the next one is privilege, privilege escalation, right? So if I can elevate my privileges, I can switch to sudo, I can do all kinds of things, right? I can do an app to get update, for example, and start installing all kinds of packages and just go rogue on the, on the container, start curling endpoints, et cetera, et cetera. So, Again, we're gonna create a deployment that's gonna use this uh, highly secure Docker sudo image. Um, and when we look at it, it's got a user and group set, right? So from an initial investigation perspective, this, can, this container image is looking a heck of a lot better than the Nginx one, right? Some user and group stuff set, May, maybe, maybe we're good, right? This is looking pretty good if we were thinking about what we were just looking for on our audit. However, now I run sudo id and I actually have the ability to better elevate my privileges to, to the root user. Now I can do all kinds of things, right? So from an audit perspective, when you go into the container and you get access, try and switch, try and elevate your privileges. See what you have available, you know, what, what do you have avail availability to be able to do? Just because they've set those initial things and from the, from the offset, it looks like you're in a good position, always try and test the boundaries. So now what we'll do is we'll set the allow privilege escalation configuration to, to false and we should not be able to elevate our privileges. So again, exactly the same deployment. We're again under that security context. We're gonna set allow privilege escalation to false and now if we deploy this and we try and perform a sudo, we do not have the ability to be able to do that. 
So again, from a security standpoint, stop people from being able to switch to sudo, right? Maybe some of your applications require sudo to be able to see certain directories. This is again, another conversation with your application developers. Start to put your configuration that your application needs in specific directories. Allow the user that that, uh, that container is running as to be able to read and maybe write to that directory. So one of the things that I would recommend from a container perspective is having a, you know, a slash app directory, which is where your application binary runs, slash config for where your config files live, and then slash data for where your data lives. Make, now we start to have a standard, right? We can allow the user, whatever we've, whatever UID and uh, user ID and, and group ID that we've specified, we allow them to be able to use those specific three directories and nothing else. We're now starting to get, to get some secure standards. So enable service links. This is an interesting one. Um, this is a very convenient way if I get inside your container to be able to start to plot your Kubernetes landscape. From a Kubernetes landscape, what I'm talking about is the services that are currently running within Kubernetes. So by default, Kubernetes will add in environment variables into your pod to make it convenient, in inverted com uh, in air quotes, for you to be able to discover other, Q uh, other Kubernetes services. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna run a BusyBox uh, pod. And if we go inside that pod and we do an env, you'll see that the service that I just created, I know everything about it. I know where it is, I know the IP address, I know the port that it's currently running on. From a hacker's perspective, this is a dream, right? Imagine you've got hundreds of, hundreds of these services. All I have to do is get into one. I do an env. I get all of your services. I know all the endpoints. I know all the ports. I just start running attacks against them, and I figure out, and I can plot your Kubernetes landscape from the inside. So it, it only takes one, one pod that allows this or has this configuration by default for me to start being able to plot my whole entire Kubernetes landscape. Luckily for us, Kubernetes has a way of being able to stop this from being displayed. Not a well-known uh, configuration option. So under the spec here, you can set enable service links to false. And what that will do now is when we run the same container image, but we have this set, when we do env, we only get the Kubernetes one, right? We have to get the Kubernetes one to be able to talk to the Kubernetes API if we need to be able to interact with Kubernetes. However, the service that we previously deployed, we cannot see anymore. So from an auditor's perspective, think about you know, what, that, what someone could do with the information by default, right? So Kubernetes by default is giving me everything. The application developers should know the endpoints, right? They should know the services, talking about consistency. There's no need for us to be able to display all this information in, you know, inside the container. Set comp profiles, so by default, workloads that get deployed into Kubernetes do not have set comp profiles provided to you. Um, pretty insecure, probably want to set some set comp profiles. Um, luckily, Kubernetes provides us with the ability to be able to set set comp profiles. So what I've done here is deployed an Nginx image and just looked at the setcom profiles that it has available and we can see there that there are, there are none. However, let's keep going. We can set setcom profiles by configuring an annotation on the workload to set a specific type. So Kubernetes actually provides you with a couple of defaults out of the box. Um, that you, you may want to use, um, or you can create your own. They are a specific type of resource in Kubernetes, and then you, at your workload level, set an annotation and then specify the setcom profile that you want to leverage. Dropping capabilities, right? We don't, every container and every workload that's currently running in a Kubernetes cluster does not need all the capabilities that it could possibly have, right? Applications barely need any. Some, some uh, public images will require more. 
So again, we have the ability to be able to set this with, within our security context. Or you could use upstream images like we were using before this Nginx Unprivileged, which sets some of these for you by default and, and uh, reduces what capabilities you have available to you. So here again, we're back to our normal Nginx image and we are gonna drop all of the capabilities within Nginx, right? We're not gonna allow any of them. This is the default position that I would go with drop all of the capabilities and slowly but surely add the ones that you need, right? Don't allow all of them and then work backwards. So this is an iterative process, <clears throat> excuse me, that you'd have to go on with your application developers to understand what capabilities they need within their application. So if we deploy this and drop all the capabilities, we can see that Nginx is unable to be able to run. And then we look at the logs we can start to understand what it needs, right? It's, it's choning some files here. So we need to allow it to be able to have the capability to be able to chone things. Again, this is an iterative process, right? You're gonna to have to keep trying and trying to run the application, dropping and allowing each type of capability until you get the holy grail and it actually runs. Your application developers are gonna love you because this is probably gonna be like a 10, 15, 30 minute exercise for every single application. So how do we reproduce this locally? So we run the Docker container itself and we use this cap drop flag and we set them to all. So this is gonna drop all of the capabilities. We again are in the same position so we can see that it needs a chone. So now what we can do is we can still keep the drop all but now add the capability of cap chone run it again, see what happens. I'm not gonna go through this iterative process, like there's four or five of them that it actually needs. Um, and then finally, you'll get to a configuration standpoint where you'll know the exact number of capabilities that your application needs to be able to run. Again, it's time consuming. However, it makes sure that the, the container configuration is as secure as it possibly can be. Yeah, continue dropping them and adding them until you, until you reach the holy grail and the application actually runs. So this is the actual Nginx configuration with the very insecure running as root image with the capabilities that need to be added. So again, to reiterate, when you're performing the audit, one of the things that we should be looking for is them dropping all of the capabilities and only adding the ones that they need to add. If this configuration is not set at all, they have all the capabilities by default. We can see the Nginx image successfully running now with those capabilities finally added. Now we also have images available to us whereby we can drop all of the capabilities because it doesn't need any, right? This is the, this is the ideal end state. I don't wanna necessarily have to add all of the capabilities line by line in my Kubernetes configuration. So by default, the Nginx unprivileged container doesn't require any new capabilities to be added, therefore we can drop all. This is the ideal uh, configuration to be able to get to this standpoint. So again, we can deploy that workload and now we can see that that workload is successfully running. So one of the things to, to bear in mind now is what is the application actually doing? What does it need to do inside the container? Maybe it's just running a binary, right? And it just provides an API endpoint or maybe it actually needs to write some configuration at startup for it to be able to know where the database connection is or where a third party application is. So by default, all of your uh, pods have a writable root file system, right? I can go in there and write whatever I want. Obviously we don't wanna be able to do that. Again, same thing again when I was talking about having that common directory structure within your application configuration. This is why we wanna to start to be able to do this, right? We wanna make the root file system by default read-only and then have directories where the application can perform its work. 
doesn't need to be able to write to all of the directories that are possible on the root file system. So what I'm doing here is I'm running our nice Docker sudo image that we ran earlier, and I'm running a sudo apt update. Right? And now, because the root file system is writable, I can install all the packages that I want. I can run anything that I want to be able to run. Right? From a hacker's perspective, this is a dream. I can install all kinds of tools. I can work out what's going on in your cluster, start to sniff traffic between services. Like The list is endless what I can do here. Right? We don't want to allow every application to be able to have a writable read-only file system. So luckily enough for us, Kubernetes provides us with a security context where we can set this to true, right? So we can set the default position to have a read-only file system. Again, we're gonna run the same image. We're gonna use the security context and set the read-only root file system to true. And when we try and do a sudo apt update, it's not possible, right? We don't have the ability for us to be able to do that. Again, we can also have and try and use this with our, with our public image that we have available to us, set the read-only file system to, uh, to true. Container is unable to run, right? Because it, if you remember before, it needed to be able to write to the, to the underlying file system. I'm going to skip through this. So what we can do is we need to be able to find and locate the directories where this application needs to be able to run. And then once we have those, we can mount those uh, mount empty directories inside of our container at the specific uh, directory location that the application actually needs. Right. So if we have application configurations where we have a standardized directory structure, this becomes very easy, right? We have the same directory structure. We create some empty volumes. They are able to write and read files from those. Okay, let's cancel out of here. Let's go to uh, RBAC. So we've talked about some workload configuration and how we can uh, secure our workloads, but RBAC allows users and workloads to be able to uh, access resources that are currently running in the Kubernetes API. So what I'm gonna demonstrate here is the unnecessary use of a list permission. So Kubernetes by default allows you to be able to get list and watch things. What we are going to do is we're going to create a service account inside of Kubernetes. We are uh, going to provide a role whereby the only thing that we can do is we can list secrets in that specific namespace. We create a role binding whereby we're going to bind that service account to that cluster role. We're going to create a secret running inside of that namespace. We're going to create a deployment. We're going to use the service account as the service account that we just created. So remember, it can only list secrets. So now I'm inside this running container. I'm going to run this command here. This command is going to try and get that specific secret that we've just deployed. Well, you'll notice is that I can't get the data from that secret. I'm getting forbidden. However, if I use the Kubernetes API to now do a list, right, and list all of the secrets, 
that I currently have available to us. I now have the ability to see every secret inside that namespace and the data within that secret. So be very careful from an audit perspective of when you're using that list. Watch also has the same problem. So you really want to make sure that the user uses uh, or your application uses get more than it does list. List is giving you way too many permissions, right? I can see every single secret inside of my whole entire namespace. I may only want to be able to get a specific secret. The next thing we want to be able to do now is after we've gone and, and looked at some of the RBAC that we have available to us, we've looked at some of the workload configuration, we now actually want to be able to perform an audit. So things that we want to look for is things that we've discussed and wanted to be able to stop before. So some high level ones, containers running as privileged, containers that are allowed to perform privilege escalation, containers that can run as root, and containers that do not have a read-only file system. So what we're doing here is honing into workloads more than we are RBAC. RBAC, is a, is a, is a, from an audit perspective, is still very important, but we're focusing here on the workloads that are currently running. So there is a tool called uh, Cube Audit by Shopify. I don't know if you, you guys are familiar with that that will allow you to be able to run this and start to look at the configuration of your, the workloads that are running in your Kubernetes cluster and see where the insecurities or vulnerabilities are. So we are gonna, we've deployed Cube Audit and we're now gonna run Cube Audit privileged in our namespace that we've currently provided. So what Privileged is doing is it's looking for any privileged containers that have the ability to be able to run. And what we can see here if we scroll up is it lists out each individual deployment and provides you warnings around your configuration. So we can see here that it's recommending that we, um, we, set, the, we set privilege to false on all of these applications that we've previously deployed. There are, there are a load of um, cube audit flags available to you. You can run cube audit in cluster mode, which essentially runs it inside the cluster and constantly runs uh, an audit for you, gets a good understanding of your Kubernetes landscape and provides you a report out the back of that. You can download that as a CSV or JSON file and you can use that to really dig into um, to your, your audit. I wanted to show guardrails, but I'm, uh, I'm conscious of time. So I'm gonna leave it there and I'm gonna open the floor for questions. Um, thanks very much. Uh, again, Jimmy, I, myself, Adam, and, and Andrew will be uh, at the Expo Hall, uh, booth G32. Uh, come along to the booth, see what we're doing. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Anyone have any questions? Yeah, so the, the URL that I provided, um, this URL here, is going to maintain online. It's the whole workshop end to end. It will go through with you. You can clone uh, the repository all of the demos, all of the scripts that we've currently run are, are in that repository. You can create a GKE cluster and run through this whole thing yourself. Uh, this one here, yeah. Yeah, it's all in there. The workshop, all of the workshop configuration is, is in here. The step by step is also yeah. Step by step is also in there. You should tell them what this. So if you if you want to be able to run the repository locally, uh, there is a make file task. Just run make run from that uh, directory. That will spin up the website for you locally. If you want to run it locally, um, and if you don't, you can use this URL here. This URL is going to be up for the whole of KubeCon and further on.
Anyone else have any questions? Perfect. Thank you much. Yeah, yeah. let's thank our speaker once again. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Thanks, Jimmy.